All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming out. So the theme for Heretics Club this semester, as I understand it, is uh, time. Um, and so my research is on us through time. <laughs> so it's about our individuality and our personalities across time. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. First, though, I'm going to make a shameless plug, uh, and maybe Regina can offer a testimonial. So I recorded um, an audio course uh, that is based on a course that I teach at Colgate. Uh, it's my course on psychotherapy. Uh, so I recorded it for this, uh, this business called Learn 25, and it's been turned into a, um, a book, basically an audio book, um, on audible.com, which is run by Amazon. Um, and I want people to read it. I get no money. Like, I'm har I was hardly paid for doing this. So I, by encouraging you to do this, you're, I'm not making any money. I just want people to find use in the course. Um, my dear friend and colleague, Regina, recently had a concussion and found this to be a soothing thing to listen to <laughs> while she was in recovery. Um, I, yeah, any. It's a great course. <laughs> anybody that's interested psychotherapy and how it works. Yeah. Really. So, anyhow, concussion I just wanted... Or no. What? Concussion or no. Either uh, way. Yeah, either way. I think you probably get more out of it if you do it when your brain is working and your neurons are firing. <laughs> <laughs> I have been told that I have a soothing voice, though, so I think it, maybe it is good for concussion material. <laughs> anyhow, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so on to our main topic for today. Okay. All right, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the development of our personality traits and how we become who we are. Um, and so these are the things that I'm going to try to, try to introduce you to. So uh, first I'm going to talk about what we know about what the most important personality traits are. Um, then I'm going to talk about how uh, what we know about how people's individual personalities affect the course of their lives. And then I'm going to address this last question about whether a personality is changeable. All right. So with each of these, I'm going to try to think about it developmentally, so how these processes emerge over time um, in keeping with the theme. And that is really, that's my, that's my area of expertise is personality development. Um, I wanted to start first by just saying really something brief about the nature of personality. What is it that makes up each of our personalities? So personality um, consists of those individual differences that we display that tend to be at least somewhat consistent um, across situations and across time. And personality is way broader than what I'm going to talk about right now. I'm really going to focus today on traits because I only have a little bit of time with you. But I wanted to mention that, pro that personality really is this incredibly broad domain that includes really most of our individual differences and the ways that we vary from each other. Um, and I'm going to just very briefly introduce you to a taxonomy, sort of an organizational structure for personality that I find really helpful that was developed by a friend and colleague, um, Dan McAdams. He's one of my heroes in psychology. Um, and if you get really interested in this topic of personality development because of this, um, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It's kind of a very um, lay-friendly introduction to the topic of personality development, and it's full of case studies of individual people. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I also recommend Dan just wrote a... Um, he wrote, well, he wrote a, a personality analysis of Donald Trump uh, in the summer of 2016. I think it's one of the, the Atlantic's most uh, read articles. And he has a book using the model I'm going to briefly mention, um, Analyzing Donald Trump, uh, that's coming out in Oxford University Press, I think, sometime this year. So uh, if, you're, if you get interested in this topic, there are, he has some great resources for exploring it further. Okay, so... So Dan has developed this model of trying to explain what makes us distinct and different from other people. Um, so what are the main components? So what we're going to focus on is personality traits. And this is probably the aspect of personality that most of you would be most familiar with. Um, 
So these traits are tendencies, again, they're, they're these sort of tendencies that we have that are expressed with some consistency across time and situation. So you may be an extrovert, but you're probably not acting super extroverted if you're sitting there listening to a lecture, right? You're probably not acting extra extroverted right now, for example. So does that mean you're no longer an extrovert? No. Um, it just means that sort of on average, as you go from situation to situation, you're going to tend to behave in a relatively more extroverted way than a person who is more introverted. Um, and so I'm going to be defining what these traits are. But I just want to mention in this model, and, um, and, and, and personality psychologists generally see things this way, there are lots of other aspects to your personality. So one aspect Dan McAdams talks about as being what he calls personal concerns, and this really has to do with the motivations that you have. This has to do with the goals you're trying to pursue, what it is that you're trying to accomplish sort of day to day or over the course of your life. Um, what are the things that you're really drawn to? What are your interests and so on? And that turns out to be a huge aspect of our personalities that's really influential. Um, it's related to traits, but it's also quite separate, right? So someone could be highly extroverted um, and they may have one of their goals um, as making a real impact on the lives of the people around them. But you could equally have an introvert, for example, right, who has that same goal. So these, these motivations are, are separate. Uh, and if I had more time, I would talk to you more about that. So, but, uh, and then the last aspect that Dan talks about uh, in terms of what is our personality, it's our narrative identity, and that is at a different level than these other aspects. And that has to do with the stories that we each develop to try to make sense out of the course of our lives. So how do we understand the way that our past has affected us? How do we make sense out of, uh, of our experiences and who that, who that has made us? Uh, what is our story for the future, and so on. Um, and these stories that we tell, we only start to develop these in adolescence, usually. It's something that college students are working on a lot. You're in this kind of rich period of narrative development as you think about your lives. Um, but this is something that also continues to develop across the course of a person's life. Regina has done some research on this topic, as have I. Um, okay. All right, so before I start talking about traits, what I want to do is show you a, a clip of, a, of an individual, because we're going to use him to illustrate um, some of the things that I'm talking about today. So this film clip, um, and this is the clip that I used in the, in, I use this clip to illustrate things in my audio book. This is a clip from the uh, film series called Seven Up. Um, have any of you heard of this film series before? If you spend any time with me, these two have already. Yeah. <laughs> I am obsessed with this film series. So I, it's, um, it's amazing, and I, you should all watch it. So the, this film series, um, it was started, when was it started? In the 60s, as um, an exploration of how social classes affect people's lives. So it was started by this uh, producer named Michael Apted in, in England, where he recruited a group of 14 people at the age of seven. And he filmed all of them at the age of seven. Um, and he wanted to show how their different socio socioeconomic class affected them already at the age of seven. But then he sort of fell in love with these 14 people. And so he came back to them seven years later when they were 14. And then he came back to them seven years after that, when they were age 21, and so on and so forth. And so the most recent uh, film in this series just came out. I haven't been able to see it yet, um, but it's 63 up. So the participants are now 63 years old. Um, one of the 14 has died, uh, which is super sad. I think all of us who have been, wa been watching this series over a period of years have become very attached to this group of 14 people. Um, so... I'm sorry? Which one died? Uh, I can't remember her name, but she was the librarian. Uh -huh. She was one of the three working class girls. Okay. Yeah, and she was the librarian. Okay. She was a lovely person. Um, so I first saw this film series when I was a freshman in college. Uh, I went to see 28 Up, which tells you how old I am. Um, uh, when I was a freshman in college, um, I went with my 
ex-boyfriend Randy uh, because he was visiting me and I didn't know how to entertain him uh, during this visit so I thought I'll just drag him to this movie. I had no idea what the movie was or what to expect. This is like pre-internet, you know, so I just thought it sounded interesting. And so anyhow, it was 28 up and I sat there just riveted to the point where I, it stayed with me and I decided that I wanted my research to focus on this. Um, meanwhile, Randy, who's now an engineering professor at Northwestern, fell asleep. And <laughs> I, exactly. I thought, you know what? That was good judgment that I broke up with him uh, in high school. Anyhow, he was a great guy, but clearly we, did, we had different interests. So anyhow, what I'm going to show you now, this is actually from 35 Up. This is my one of my two favorite characters in the film. His name is Paul. And he was recruited from, he was placed in a group home when he was young because his mother had died. And at the time, they thought fathers could not take care of kids by themselves. So they removed him from his dad's house, put him in a group home. Um, so he was kind of seen as, there were a couple boys in the film who, who were in a group home at the time that they started the series at age seven. So just as you watch him, just kind of try to think about what his personality is like, and then I'm going to use him to illustrate some things um, as we go. I don't like them. The big boys hitting us and a prefix sending us out, out for nothing. I know I prefer to be alone, really. I find it hard to express emotion most of the time. Although I'm, I'm getting on top of that more now, you know. I mean, just a simple thing to say to sort of Susan, you know, I love you, something like that. I mean, I, could, I can tell you about it, but... Um, I, I really haven't been able to say it freely to Sue, you know. <laughs> well, what yes. was it that you fell in love with? What is it about him? His helplessness, I suppose. It was the motherly instinct in me to pick him up and cuddle him. And he's also very good looking, I think, but he doesn't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> and in the summer, he's got this cute little bum in shorts. <laughs> I mean, I can tell quite a few stories here, but, but the one that really irritates me the most is when we have an argument, he says, that's it, leave me. And I say, fine, all right, I will one day. <laughs> but that's it. You know, after all these years of marriage, we've been married for, what, 13 years now or something, and he still says, you're leaving me. Well, one day I might just pack my bags and go, yes. <laughs> at seven, Paul was at a children's home in London. Were you happy at the children's home in England? We didn't mind that really, because we didn't know what was going on, because we were a bit young. And my mother and father got, well, they separated originally, I think. Um, they eventually got divorced. I went to the boarding school for one year, and then we immigrated to Australia. My father got remarried. Um, How did you get on with your stepmother? Pretty well, but... Like I said before, I mean, I'm not, I'm not just not close, I'm not really close to my father, either. Do you have any regrets about the fact that you weren't closer to him when you were younger? Yeah, I suppose it's all, all wasted time in a way, I suppose. I mean, he was always there, you know, I could always talk to him, but it, it was different. A lot of people that go out to Australia and live English people, they grow up without family, you know, and then all of a sudden, Paul's come here and he's got all this family that he, he sort of half knew existed. Now, the first one, the red brick one... So Paul brought Sue and his two children, Katie and Robert, to visit the family for the first time. Do you think about England much when you're in Australia? Only when the cricket's on. <laughs> I mean, I'm in awe of everything I see because I've always wanted to come to London. I've always thought it'd be a great thing to do. And um, all of a sudden I'm here and I'm having a great time and the Paul and the kids are just... I'm just dragging them along behind like an anchor, you know. Come on, we're off. <laughs> but no, it'll be really interesting because I've always had lots of family and I, and I love this sort of stuff, you know. A bit of a show pony. <laughs> well, when the crunch came and we were coming over here, I didn't want to do it. It's just something in me that holds me back. I, I just, it's shyness or something, I'm not sure. Well, I, I'm not really good at meeting new people, I guess, with that toy. Is there any way you would want to be a father any differently from the way your father was to you? I'd like to be more um, 
contact close, actual physical contact close, because my dad and I are, are exactly the same like that. We, you know, if we hug, it's unusual. <laughs> When we had Katie, when she was born, Paul was, he said to me, and said, oh, I'm glad I've got a daughter. He said, mm. when I'm an old man, at least she'll come up and she'll be able to give me a kiss and a cuddle. Would you like to get married, uh, Paul? Tell me why not. I don't like um, saying say you had a wife. They, they say you had to eat what they cooked you. And, and say I don't like greens, well, I don't. Mm. And so she said, you have to eat what, what you give, give. So I, I don't like greens, so she gives me greens. And, that, and that's it. <laughs> I think of what Paul's going to do. I mean, Paul doesn't say it's very bad, but I wouldn't like that for my children. What keeps this marriage together? Learn to keep your mouth quiet at times. <laughs> I don't know. Tolerance, I think. I mean, we don't stew it. We have arguments, big arguments, like anyone else. Um, but we have spoken about this before. We, we don't seem to stew over it for any length of time. Now, we can be unbelievable together, you know, like biting each other's heads off. But, but we don't... I mean, it's a, we'd never go another to the next day. This is one thing that the show's done to us, is that it makes you analyse things a bit more, you know, like maybe if the show hadn't been here, we, we may have split up because you think, well, we can see what we were like a long time ago and it, and it, and it brings it back to you, you think, well, you know, we have this then. Often a lot of people grow apart and they can't see what they had originally. I don't think the show could actually hold you together. No, no, but, but what it's showing you is what you had in the past. Yeah. In their 20s, Paul and Sue sold up, bought an old van and travelled through Australia. I think it brought us closer together because, you know, we really got to know each other and we relied on each other so much. It gave us our own peace of mind that we could settle down and, and now have a family, that we had done something. We hadn't just been nobodies and lived in suburbia all our lives. We'd done something that we were proud of. Okay. All right. So that's Paul. Um... I'm not, I'm not going to show you, I was going to show you a little bit of a second one, but I think for the sake of time, we'll just stick with Paul. So um, a bunch of the people in this series ended up getting divorced at, at one point or another. Um, any guesses? Do you think Paul is one of the people who would go on to get divorced, or do you think he's going to be with his wife? What do you think? Because we're going to be talking about how personality shapes life outcomes. Any guesses? Probably not. Sounds like they had a healthy conflict resolution strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer at the end, but yeah. Well, so if you were to de try to describe his personality, sort of what, what he's like as a person, what would you, what would you say? Like what, what kind of stands out to you? Yeah. Yeah, so like not a high energy sort of guy, right? People mean different things by laid back. Yeah, right? Because sometimes that means like that you don't get anxious or upset about things or you're not easily bothered. Or it might mean that you're just kind of chill in the sense of being like not a super loud, kind of vibrant, whatever, energetic person. Yeah. Other, th other thoughts? Yeah. Reserved. Reserved, definitely. Yeah. Um, other things that stand out? Yeah. Of, are you? A, did you take an attachment class? Okay, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I, he actually is a combination of avoidant and and uh, kind of like anxious, uh, like resistant kind of. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I actually use him to illustrate attachment when I'm teaching personality. Um, but anyhow, that has to do with motivation, sort of. And your it's not really a trait, right? It's it has to do with sort of his motivation in relationships. And yeah, he definitely has a style where he's afraid of being abandoned. You can see he kind of pulls back if he's afraid. Yeah. Um, so that's part of that kind of personal concerns domain that that McAdams talks about. Anything else? Yeah. He finds it hard to show affection. Yeah, or he's a little, he's, he's reserved in showing affection too, right? He, that's why he's so happy to have a daughter. He feels like that's going to be a little easier for him. 
Well, we'll, we'll keep talking about him um, as we go. And, and at the end, I'll kind of fill you in on how things are for him, at least at 56 up, because I, as I said, I haven't seen 63 yet. So, okay, so let's talk about these traits. So um, traits are the earliest part of your personality, earliest aspect of your personality to emerge. So even babies demonstrate traits. They're pretty unstable then, but there are even aspects of um, kind of later extroversion that you can see even in young kids um, and, and other traits as well. So this emerges way before those personal concerns or narratives, obviously, right? Um, and we do know that there are heritable influences on the kind of traits that I'm going to be talking about. So um, behavior genetic studies would suggest that if you look at the variation in these traits across people, about 30 to 40 percent of the variation across people is due to genetic differences across people. That's not a statistic you apply to a person. It's not like 30 to 40 percent of your traits come from your genes. It, it just explains that about a third to you know, like 40 percent of the variation across people seems to be due to genetic differences. Um, but that means also that there's influences of the environment on people's traits. And there's no difference for, these, for how genetic any of these traits are. They're all equally heritable, which is, was a surprise to the field. So the model that uh, has been accepted broadly by personality psychologists for describing personality traits is, is called the five-factor model. It spells the mnemonic device OCEAN. Um, so openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So I'm going to talk about what those big five traits are right now. So I'm so sorry, but the Myers-Briggs traits, not, not accurate. Uh, <laughs> um, this is really the agreed-upon model that by far has the most research support. Okay, so we'll start with the one that I think is most familiar to, to the most people. Um, Jung's conception of extroversion as to whether you get your energy from outer or inner sources is not generally the way that most personality psychologists see this trait. Um, so this is how it's seen. So extroversion, oh, and, and let me just say, all of these traits, they are all on dimensions. So you could be low, you could be here, you could be here, you could be in the middle, you could be a little higher, a little higher, et cetera, up to a high. So when I say extrovert, introvert, that's just a rough categorization. There's no dichotomy between these traits, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So they're all on a continuum. Okay, so extroversion um, is the extent to which you are sociable, assertive, Higher energy, so this relates sort of to what I think you're describing as laid back. He's not high, he's not high energy. Um, and annoyingly, I think to, to many people, there's some evidence that part of what's at the core of extroversion is your propensity toward positive emotions. So there's evidence that people who are more extroverted tend to experience more positive emotions than people who are more introverted. And as I said, some of these differences appear in infancy, but it's not like you can predict from a baby whether they're going to turn out to be extroverted or introverted. So these would be kind of, for all of these, I'm just going to show you typical questions, typical items to measure them. So an extroverted person would be, um, I'm someone who's outgoing and sociable, has an assertive personality, full of energy, versus on the other end, tending to be quiet, <laughs> preferring to have other people take charge, rarely feeling excited or eager. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, and so we can all agree, I think, that Paul is quite introverted, right? I th th to me, that's one of his most distinguishing characteristics. He himself even says that, you know, he, he's hesitant to meet new people. I mean, I think that just comes through in everything about him. He married someone who is extremely high on extroversion, right? You can see there is no evidence for that opposites attract idea. Um, that's actually a falsity, but it just happens that in their case, that, that is true. We have one extreme introvert and an extreme extrovert, and for them, that actually seems to work pretty well. Um, okay, the next trait, my personal favorite. Neuroticism. This is the one I'm most interested in. Um, this has to do with how, how prone you are toward experiencing a wide range of negative emotions. So how prone are you to feeling irritable or um, easily upset, anxious, sad, um, kind of vulnerable? Um, it turns out that, that your kind of tendencies to feel any one of these is a little bit related to your tendency to feel the other. And so some of us are just... 
um, much more prone to experience a lot of different negative emotions more intensely, more often, and then some people um, are, are much less so. Um, it's related to um, people's tendency toward anxiety and depression and sort of emotional volatility. And these are the kind of items that are often used. You can just kind of read through those. Um, it's interesting. This is a domain where we don't have as many words to describe low neuroticism. So we have a rich vocabulary for describing high, but we actually don't, there aren't that many descriptors in the natural language to describe someone who's, who's low on this. Um, and so as I said, um, it, this reflects your propensity to ex experience and express negative emotions. It is also measurable to some extent in infants, though of course our capacity for experiencing anxiety and so on, it becomes much more complex as we get older, right, as our thinking capacities sort of come online. Um, yeah, so Charlie Brown is a good example <laughs> of, of this. He's highly neurotic. Um, or we have Anxiety Girl. Um, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> uh, so people who are higher on this trait... This is one of the features. They often have characteristic styles of thinking, uh, including this is called catastrophizing, which is kind of where you can assume the worst possible outcome to any situation that you find yourself in. Um, so thoughts on Paul. Is he, where would you put him on the neuroticism dimension? Does he look anxious, vulnerable, and insecure? Initially, yes, although he gets a little less as he gets older. Yes, so he, it, at least at first, you can see that he's, I, I think he's quite high on this dimension. You can see, I mean, he's not so ir angry or irritable, um, but he is definitely prone to sadness, anxiety, vulnerability, all of those things. And he does suffer from mental health problems as he gets older. He has bouts of depression, um, that would, and that would be kind of consistent with that. But as Regina said, he, he becomes less neurotic as he gets older, which I will talk about more in just a minute. Um, conscientiousness has to do with your tendencies to be organized, planful, having high goals, being responsible, um, and so end. And then at the low end, people tend to be very impulsive. They act without thinking. They don't plan ahead for things. Um, so the items would be things like this. You can go ahead and read those. Um, this dimension turns out to be incredibly important for a lot of things. I'll, I'll say more about that in a, in a minute, but it's like it has an impact on virtually every domain of life. Um, it's hard to tell how conscientious he is, right? We didn't see him working or doing anything like that. I, I can tell you from watching him more, he's probably sort of in the middle on this. I mean, he doesn't seem particularly high or low. He seems like a good worker, but not like, I don't know. Not especially high, yeah. How much does it overlap with neuroticism? They're totally <laughs> separate. So what's really, um, not totally, actually. So some of these dimensions do tend to somewhat correlate with each other. So there's like a slight negative relationship between neuroticism and conscientiousness. So the more neurotic you are, the less conscientious you tend to be. Um, it seems to have to do with your capacity for self-regulation, Yeah. Um, okay, next dimension, agreeableness. I hate this name because um, it just sounds so blah for what I think is a profoundly important um, trait. Um, so it's your tendency to start empathy, kindness, trust, being warm versus hostile. And then at the low end, being, if you're disagreeable, you tend to be aggressive, hostile, um, cynical, very cyn like egotistical, manipulative, all those kinds of bad things. The person who named this trait was super disagreeable, and so that's why I think he picked a, um, a kind of pejorative-sounding name for what is actually an incredibly positive <laughs> trait. <laughs> um, and, yeah, quick story. I always have to tell this story. I actually went to a very small meeting with this, the guy who named the trait. It was like a 15-person meeting, Paul Costa. So I went to this meeting with him, and one day at breakfast, um, he was sitting there with his wife, and he looked at me, and he was like, you are really agreeable for being a, um, a researcher. And I was like, thank you? 
because I could already tell that he didn't think this was necessarily a great trait to have. But anyhow, okay. Um, so this one is measured at the high end. You can see um, being compassionate, having a soft heart, trying, tending to be respectful, assuming the best about other people versus being cold, uncaring, rude, all those kinds of things. Um, how about Paul? Where, what do you think, where do you think Paul falls? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think he's actually a very kind, compassionate person, empathic. He's not hostile. He's not cynical. He's not, like, just out for himself. I mean, I, he's, he doesn't seem aggressive, right? Even though he experienced adversity, he was never aggressive to other people. Um, so I think he's reasonably high on it. Okay, this last trait is very hard to understand. It's openness to experience or intellect. Um, it's really hard to understand, so <laughs> I, I'm going to try to explain it to you, but the, don't pay attention to the name, okay? <laughs> this trait has to do with how much you tend to be really um, engaged in things that are intellectually appealing and kind of like aesthetically appealing. So it's how much do you find kind of complex material to be like really engaging, does that make sense? So a person who's really high on this trait is going to be the kind of person who's going to want to go see the opera and, you know, is going to want to be reading, like, complicated newspaper articles on the time, all the time and is going to choose kind of a career that's, you know, where they're intellectually engaged a lot. Um, so it's openness to experience in the sense of it's not like, you know, this means that you, I don't know, that you're traveling all the time or something like that. You could be a, tr a person who travels all the time and actually not be that open to experience. Um, so these are descriptors. So people who are high on this tend to be more perceptive, imaginative, curious. And at the low end, it's interesting. This has to do with how conforming you tend to be, um, how practical sort of you are, um, having kind of more narrow interests. Um, these would be items that measure it. So people who are higher on this tend to be more creative, have more interest in the arts, and so on. Okay, so let me just say, I'm going to have to go through some of this stuff super briefly. Um, so how our personality traits, traits shape the life course? Um, so there's so much research on this. Uh, some of my own research is on this topic. Is To what extent do people's traits predict some of the important life outcomes that we are interested in? So... Um, you know, we might be interested in how it affects friendships uh, or people's romantic relationships or work or especially among older people, their health. And there's, as I said, there are hundreds of studies that have linked these traits with these kinds of outcomes. So I'm just going to mention a few of the outcomes that we know about just really briefly. But keep in mind, these are all kind of like modest relationships between the traits and these outcomes. So in other words, they're not perfectly predictive. They're not even close to perfectly predictive. You know, um, yeah. So let me, let me show you some of what we know. Okay. So extroversion is linked with being happier, uh, which is not surprising because it kind of involves positive emotions. And also having just more social connections, tending to have kind of more, more friendships. Um, Neuroticism, though I love this trait so much, uh, it's linked with all of these different problematic outcomes. Um, like, as I said, mental health, it's one of the biggest predictors for anxiety, depression, um, PTSD. Um, and it also has, tends to have negative effects on people's relationships, too. Um, I have to say, though, like, I know so many super neurotic people who are very successful and have great relationships. And so one of the things that I really hope to pursue in this part of my career is trying to figure out how people who are high on this trait are able to be effective and kind of manage it day to day. Because uh, I, I, as I said, it's, there's not a perfect relationship. Conscientiousness, as I promised, it's related to all these things. So it's like the best predictor of how well you're going to do in school. It, pre it, it adds to the prediction beyond people's intelligence. Um, it, it is the best, like of the five, it's the most related to how well you do at work. Um, and interestingly, it also has to do with relationships because it, I think it's easier to be in a relationship if the person is um, conscientious. Um, and it affects like... 
there's actually research showing that the more conscientious your partner is, the better you tend to do. <laughs> so it sort of affects the, the yeah, it affects the, the partner as well. Um, agreeableness um, is the most related, I think, to having more kind of strong friendships with people, better at being better at managing conflict, not surprisingly. In kids, this one is really related to whether kids are going to develop conduct problems or not, so more disagreeable kids tend to um, get in trouble a lot more. Although on the downside, it's actually linked with lower incomes. So um, <laughs> I think that a lot of the careers that where a high agreeableness can flourish are things that aren't paid as well, right? If you think about it, like, I don't know, being a social worker, yeah, some, as some types of teaching, whereas a lot of the careers that are extremely lucrative involve kind of cutting off your empathy toward other people. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think there are careers in finance, for example, that, you know, where having too much empathy, being a concerned about the impact of your choices on other people, um, probably makes you less effective. And anyhow, so that, this is very striking to me that, that there is this re negative relationship between the two. Um, finally, openness is kind of not as relevant to most life outcomes, but it is linked with your political leanings. So at, at higher openness, people tend to be more liberal, right? Lower openness, people tend to be more conservative. Um, okay, so... Can I, do I have like five more minutes? I don't know. That's okay. So does personality ever change? <laughs> so this is one of the things I'm most interested in. You know, how stable do people's personalities tend to be and what predicts whether they change or not over time? So there's now really good evidence that it, it does change. So there was this old idea in the field that personality was kind of um, set in stone. Right? Especially by the age of 30, no more change for you. You know, you're, you are who you are. Um, but the new view is now sort of, they, they talk about it as being sort of set in plaster. Um, it, that it, there are changes that happen, especially during the first several decades of life, but there's change all the way up through old age. So when we think about change, this is a little hard to conceptualize, but there are kind of there are two big different kinds of change. One has to do with, as we all get older, do we all kind of change in a general fashion? So are there average changes in the level of these traits as you move from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to you know, older adulthood and so on? Um, uh, and the answer is yes. I mean, this is definitely, people do kind of tend to change on average. Um, so during late adolescence and adulthood, on average, people start to become more conscientious, especially once they start full-time work. Like, that life experience makes a difference. It makes, forces you to be more conscientious. Um, people tend to become more agreeable as they get older. And they also, on average, tend to become less neurotic. And that's especially true if they get into a stable romantic relationship. That is a big predictor of tending to become less neurotic. Um, there's newer research looking at young adolescents, because that's my area, is like children and adolescents, um, where they're trying to figure out what happens to personality. And it's just what you think, which is basically like, as you go through elementary school, kids tend to become less agreeable, right? They become less conscientiousness. There's this big dip, basically, in early adolescence, where people are, kids are less conscientious, they're less kind, um, there, for girls at least, there's an increase in neuroticism um, that happens during that age too. This is I, I've done consulting with these companies that want to say like we're going to come in and help kids develop better personalities, and we're going to measure how their personalities change. And then we have to tell them there's just this natural dip where all kids get worse, or like almost all kids get worse. <laughs> so if you want to prove that you're making kids better, you have a hard task because they are just naturally going to kind of get worse at a certain age. Um, the other kind of change has to do with how much do you change compared in your standing relative to other people? Like, if you tend to be highly extroverted as a kid, are you going to be highly extroverted as, as an adult compared to other people? There, the, the stability is kind of, it's hard for me to describe, but there's kind of like moderate 
stability to personality, even already starting by the age of three, there's some evidence that kids maintain some consistency in their traits over time, but they also still change. And again, that that continues through the whole life course, which I find encouraging. Now that I, I, like when I first started studying this, I was in my late 20s, and I was like, oh, I don't care if it stops by the time you're 50. But now that I'm 51, and there's still so many things I'd like to change about myself, um, uh, yeah, I, I feel glad that, that there's a lot of evidence for change. Can people change their, their personalities intentionally? Um, yes, there was a great paper that came out recently showing that people can make fairly substantial changes to their traits. Um, this was a this was a, a an online article that I um, that I gave some input to. It was about how to kind of master your neuroticism, um, about how can you intentionally make changes in your level of neuroticism if that is an issue. Um, I have a bunch of suggestions for how to do that, but I, I see that I'm running out of time. Um, but I will, I will mention this. There people have studied the effects of therapy on people's personality traits to see does therapy lead to changes in people's traits. And there's good evidence that therapy particularly has an impact on neuroticism, as we would expect and hope that people who undergo high-quality therapy, um, by the end, you know, even after, say, four months or so, tend to be less neurotic. Um, so there's pretty, there's pretty good evidence that people can deliberately make those kind of changes. Okay, so let me wrap up by, by mentioning Paul. So he's a person who changed over time. He certainly became less neurotic, um, happier, and to me, he's one of the sort of success stories. You know, here's a kid who started out in a group home. He stayed married. He has stayed married to his wife through this whole time, as you all predicted. They have had a super happy marriage overall. When I compare them to other people in this series, um, he has found a fulfilling career later in his life um, working at an old person's home. Uh, doing maintenance there, and I, like he's especially good with really old people because he is a kind, compassionate person. Um, there you see him at the end. The hair's gone, but uh, he's yeah, he's somebody that I think has achieved a super happy life in spite of having personality challenges, in spite of facing adversity. Right? He's someone who was able to kind of choose things. He's somebody who went through therapy several times. Um, so he's kind of an encouraging piece of evidence for the potential that people can um, change their personalities. So I will stop.